Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'll give uh, just a brief little amount of time, get everybody inside. All right, I think we can get started. Um, good morning or, or good afternoon, uh, depending on time zones. <laughs> uh, as, as an Arizona native, we kind of like to fly in the face of those. But thank you so much for joining us today for what promises to be a robust and deeply informative discussion with our illustrious panel. I'm Scott Brooks, the Executive Director of the Integrity Project, and I'm pleased and privileged to be able to welcome everyone to this inaugural webinar in our Integrity Matters series, uh, a real discussion about election integrity an event that is being co-hosted by the Integrity Project, as well as our friends at the University of Wisconsin's Election Research Center. And we very much want to start things off with our heartfelt appreciation for their contributions to this event. So thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with or acquainted with who the Integrity Project is and what we're about, uh, we are an apolitical 501c3 dedicated to the notions of critical thinking, media literacy, academic exploration, and civil discourse all with an eye towards combating what has quickly become one of the defining problems of the modern era, mis- and disinformation. Our multifaceted approach centers around robust research, education efforts, and public awareness campaigns, and is focused here on the state of Arizona specifically, which has been the subject of discussions about many of the very issues that we will be talking about today. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about us, who we are, what we do, please do visit us after the event at tipaz.org. With the 2024 election now in full swing, uh, for better or worse, depending on how you like seeing political ads, how often, um, <laughs> we, we felt it was important to have a discussion about election integrity that was a little different. Since the 2020 election, there have been a lot of questions raised surrounding different aspects of our election, some valid, some less so. But instead of what often ends up happening during these conversations, instead of just dismissing misinformation or misunderstandings out of hand, uh, we felt it was important to address these concerns head on, admitting that there are certain aspects of the system of elections that aren't perfect, while responding to incorrect perceptions in a respectful way. Uh, hence the title of the event, A Real Discussion About Election Integrity. And today, I believe we have assembled a panel uh, that has the experience to do just that. Now, I would at this point uh, be introducing the previously billed moderator, Dr. Barry Burden of the Elections Research Center. Unfortunately, he'll be unable to join us today. Uh, but he has, however, left us in uh, our wonderful panel in the eminently capable hands of his colleague at the Elections Research Center, Dr. Kenneth Mayer. Dr. Mayer has had more than 50 articles and papers published across a variety of the subjects uh, that we'll be discussing today. His teaching and research interests are in American government and institutions, especially Congress and the presidency, campaign finance and election administration. Uh, his recent research focused on voting rights and election administration. He's a frequent expert witness in election cases in both state and federal courts. Dr. Mayer is the author of With the Stroke of a Pen, Executive Orders and Presidential Power, The Political Economy of Defense Contracting, and was co-author of The Dysfunctional Congress, The Individual Roots of an Institutional Dilemma. And I made sure that question mark was in there because it's very important distinction. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him with us today to moderate the conversation with this esteemed panel. Thank you again, Dr. Mayer, uh, and I will let you take it away from here. So thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a privilege to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they will make their presentations. They'll each speak for about 10 minutes and then we will open it up or have conversation about questions that arise. Our first panelist is Tammy Patrick, a certified elections registration administrator and the CEO for programs at the National Association of Election Officials, commonly known as the Election Center. Tammy spent 11 years as the federal compliance officer for the Maricopa County Elections Department in the great state of Arizona. She was also a senior advisor to the elections program at the Democracy Fund and was appointed to President Barack Obama's Presidential Commission on Election Administration. Welcome, Tammy. Our next panelist is Kim Wyman, who was elected the 15th Secretary of the State of Washington, serving from 2013 to 2021, and she is currently a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. 
After being elected to her third term as Secretary of State, she resigned in early 2021 to accept a position with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the Biden administration uh, to work on election security. Welcome, Secretary Wyman. Trey Grayson, our third panelist, served as the 83rd Secretary of State for the state of Kentucky from 2004 to 2011. Mr. Grayson served formally as the president and CEO of the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce as director of the Harvard Institute of Politics at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and is currently a partner at Frost Brown Todd Law in Florence, Kentucky, where he heads their advocacy and policy practice. Thank you, Secretary Grayson. Our final panelist is Nathan Persley, a James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School with appointments in the Departments of Political Science, Communication, and the Freeman Spugley Institute of International Studies. He is the founding co-director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center and its program on democracy and the internet, as well as the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. Thank you, Dr. Persley. So we'll let uh, Tammy Patrick go first, take it away. Great, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, what I wanted to do this morning or afternoon, as, as you stated, depending on where you are in the country, is kind of frame up this conversation. Uh, I wanted to kick off by talking about transparency and observation in our election system and how that's really where we can strike a balance while limiting chaos. And what I mean by that is that there are challenges in this moment with being transparent as an election official. While we want to make sure that um, the procedures and practices are available for observation to the public, we also have to make sure that we're ensuring the security of the system. And this is a tension that election officials have had to deal with for the last couple of election cycles because you want to make sure that the general population understand what's happening in your office, what security measures are in place, but you also don't want to... Um, give away too much information so that you could expose some potential vulnerabilities to bad actors. Because there is a possibility of things being taken out of context, being taken um, and used and manipulated in a way that um, would be problematic to the system. What I specifically mean by that is that when we have observation um, and transparency of, of the system, such as live streaming of processing, which in Arizona, it's been um, standard operating procedures since I think about 2007, um, where everything is available online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when uh, ballots are being counted and processed from the time that they are the machines are tested to the close of um, certification. When you expose yourself and demonstrate everything that's happening, there are those that can take information out of context and use it to um, support whatever their specific narrative is versus what is actually happening, what is actually being seen. And we've seen this crop up across the country in a number of ways. Um, my favorite example is um, right there in Maricopa County, the black bags showing up in the tabulation room, which is standard operating procedure, but it was being portrayed on social media and other places as though there was something untoward that was happening, um, which couldn't be further from the truth. The other piece around uh, transparency has to do with the transparency of our records, of our information um, that are subject to FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act. Now, traditionally, um, these types of requests have been used by the press, sometimes by parties or candidates. But what we've seen in the last few years have been massive FOIA campaigns, which have diverted limited resources and quite frankly, have been almost fishing expeditions. Um, and I say that really purposely because many of these campaigns have been coordinated efforts, um, denial of service attacks, if you were, across the country, because in many instances, the requests are asking for things that don't even exist in that state, um, whether it's a cast vote record or, or some other um, piece of information that isn't even applicable. So it's burdening the election officials with these requests and diverting some of their very uh, limited resources. And I will say that this is not a partisan question. It's not a partisan issue. Um, these burdens are being felt all across the country, red states, blue states, purple states, 
swing states or not, um, but it's specifically impacting some of our small and rural offices. Um, and there was a, a recent uh, study that came out from Reed College, the local election official survey, and it asked election officials about their workload. And what we're seeing is that small rural offices are really seeing a dramatic increase in their workload associated with elections. In fact, the um, the distinction between when you're not in election mode and in election mode in a large jurisdiction, they said the workload is now 50% greater than it was in the past. Um, but for small jurisdictions, those that are 5,000 to 25,000 um, voters, it was a 250% increase. For the smallest jurisdictions, less than 5,000 voters being served, it was a 525% increase in their workload. That's untenable for these small offices that are under-resourced, and it can virtually bring things to a grinding halt. So we have this transparency that we want to do and be um, in the process, and we want to make sure that there's observation of what's happening. I know when I was in Maricopa County, I was so thankful for having observers out in the field in the 1,100 plus polling places. And observation is widespread in the United States. All states have some sort of observation of the system, but who can observe and what they can observe varies. So most commonly it's a party or a candidate representative. Um, often they can uh, observe voting in the polling place all the way to tabulation, voter intent adjudication, all sorts of things. But we wanna make sure that observation is meaningful. We need to make sure that those who are observing can get close enough to see and hear what's happening, but still maintaining the privacy of the voter and keeping ballots secure that they don't have access to actually um, reaching out and touching equipment or ballots. And we also, as I mentioned, we need to make sure that they understand what they're seeing. So we can do that through training of observers, signage, that sort of thing. In this moment, as we prepare for 2024, I think it's particularly important that we establish guidelines for observation in the coming election and that they are agreed upon well in advance of election, it's even starting. Um, now is the time to set those guidelines to make sure um, that there are policies in place for where they can individuals can stand, what they can do, what they can see. I had a state elections director tell me that his favorite thing to say was, you're here to observe, which means you use your ears and your eyes and not your mouth. Um, because they're not there to sow chaos. They're not there, and I will say that was a Republican that that framed it that way to me. Um, and it was, you know, it was really important that they had policies in place to remove individuals if, in fact, they tried to leverage that position as a, a chaos agent. Um, the other thing that's important, I think, in this moment to know is that we have checks and balances in place through testing and audits, whether it's logic and accuracy testing of the equipment before the election or a myriad of audits that we have available at um, the disposal of election officials for after the election, whether it's um, an accounting and reconciliation audit, so you balance the number of voters and the number of ballots, or a hand count audit to specifically make sure that one batch was um, correctly counted by a specific machine. And then we have risk limiting audits that are spreading across the country, and those determine was the correct winner declared. Um, and what these types of tests and audits really kind of see or, or um, find is sometimes we have printing or proofing errors. There might be an issue with a candidate rotation or a program uh, problem, but it will also catch if there's been any sort of malfeasance. And that's where the integrity of the process is tantamount. We need to make sure that the system maintains integrity, but also those who manage it. And it's very difficult, I think, for election officials. I always found it very problematic when people talked about the integrity of the, of the election because I felt like it was impugning my personal integrity um, if something went wrong. And we need to understand that in this moment, we cannot continue to attack election officials because undermining of confidence has has dire consequences. We have a high turnover rate of election officials, which results in a loss of institutional knowledge from those leaving the field. Um, and the good news from some uh, reporting from the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, so I hope I'm not stepping on Tim, Kim's toes on this one, um, is that they found that those individuals who have stepped into the moment will be conducting elections this uh, fall in uh, jurisdictions have about eight years of, of experience. So that's really good to know. 
But we need to make sure that those who are filling these um, vacancies are doing so with the correct motivations, that they're going to adhere to standards of conduct um, of the field. And um, at Election Center, decades ago, we established um, some code of conduct for the field itself, and we've recently re-released those. And this is the sort of thing that the general public need to understand. Election officials hold their positions um, very, very seriously to uphold the Constitution, to be accountable for maintaining public confidence in honest and impartial elections, to protect the public office from manipulation for personal or partisan gain, and to maintain the highest level of integrity in performing the duties of their profession. It's um, what election professionals um, hold dear, and I think that it's important for the, the voters that they serve understand that you know, every day, if there's, I often say, if there's a day ending in a Y, there's an election official somewhere um, registering voters and, and doing the good work of the people um, that entrust them with this sacred duty. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, Secretary Wyman. <laughs> well, thank you. And Tammy, you never, never step on my toes. You're good. You're good. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, absentee ballot, absentee balloting, and more importantly, mail-in voting. Because since the 2020 election, there certainly has been a lot of there have been a lot of accusations made about the uh, rampant fraud that's happening in our um, mail-in voting systems and with drop ballot drop boxes. So, what I want to do today is address the concerns that people have raised and talk about the security and control measures in you know, nine minutes um, that are built into these systems that balance access and security, as well as maintain voters' uh, secrecy of their ballot. So I'm gonna talk about first a little bit about how absentee uh, voting evolved into vote by mail elections and how um, ballot drop boxes sort of came into that mix. And more importantly, how we secure those processes so that every American can have confidence that ballots that are cast by mail are cast with integrity and they are cast by the voter who's eligible to participate and that voter only votes once. So I think Tammy really did a good job of outlining the challenge of the American election system because no two voting districts in our country are alike. Um, our country's jurisdictions range in size from 174 registered voters in Cranberry Isles, Maine, to the over 5.5 million registered voters in Los Angeles County, California. So each state has its own unique laws and rules and complexities that make their elections special and unique to their state. And this is both a strength and a weakness, I think, of, of our U.S. system because um, it's very easy to conflate what happens in one state with another state and say, well, something must be wrong because they're doing X, Y, Z in, in Maine, but they're not doing it here in, in our state in Florida. So, um, what we really try to do with mail-in voting is, um, have kind of common, uh, security measures that are in place and go from state to state. And, um, this, of course, varies widely because the states do it differently. And I think how we got to vote by mail elections and really came to a head in, in the COVID election of 2020 was a trend that started in the West in the 1980s when they started expanding absentee ballots to seniors and they could sign up as a permanent absentee voter. Over the course of the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, states like Oregon and Washington, of which I was uh, an election official and then Secretary of State, uh, moved to, to vote by mail elections because voters wanted it. Our voters really liked to, to be able to have a ballot mailed to their house 20 days before an election or 18 days before an election, so they had time to, to vote and it fit with their lifestyles. So what we found by about 2004, when we had the closest governor's race in the country's history, is that we were running two very complex elections simultaneously, a full-blown poll site election and a full-blown vote-by-mail election. And so after that election, the legislature allowed counties to move to vote-by-mail, and over the course of the next 10 years, the state became a vote by mail state. And what we really have seen is this uptick that came in 2020, where 43% of the ballots cast 
were cast by mail. That was a high water mark. It is. It has since gone down. But um, I know that coming out of the 2020 election, there were a lot of allegations of rampant fraud and misuse and ballot box stuffing. And um, I want to just talk now about how election officials secure mail-in balloting in a way that makes sure it's it's exactly or more secure than than polling place or early voting is. So to kind of level set, as with all types of voting, early in-person voting, election day voting, and mail-in voting, election officials have to ensure that only eligible voters are participating in the election and that only one ballot is counted for each of those eligible voters. So all of the security measures that are in place in early voting sites, in polling places, also are modeled in, in, in place for vote by mail and, and mail-in voting. Um, and in fact, I, a little distinction here, absentee ballots, the difference between an absentee ballot and a mail-in ballot is that an absentee ballot is typically requested by a voter, a mail-in voter ballot is sent to the voter without without them asking for it. And so um, I'm going to use the term mail-in voting just to make it kind of universal and make it make it cleaner for these purposes. But the path of a mail-in ballot um, really has four major phases that it passes through during an election. There's the planning phase of the election, preparing and mailing the ballots to the voters, the third part is receiving and processing those return ballots. And then finally, it's reporting the election results and canvassing the election. So uh, the election planning really starts months and sometimes years in advance of an election, depending on how complex and how much turnout we anticipate uh, an election having. And the critical phase of this element for mail-in voting is both finalizing the voter registration list that will be used to mail ballots to voters and programming the tabulation system so that election officials know what ballot to send to each individual voter. So the programming of the election starts uh, with the layout of the ballot issues and candidate races that a voter is going to see. And the way that election officials group these is they group them usually at the precinct level by commonalities of the, you know, presidential race, congressional races, local legislative races and, and local races that um, may be happening at the county or the municipal level. And all of those are arranged by what we call ballot styles, meaning that each individual voter is going to be assigned an individual ballot style. And in any given election, there can be hundreds to thousands of ballot styles in an individual county or jurisdiction. So the purpose of that is to ensure that the voter gets the proper ballot, that you as a voter receive the issues and candidates you're supposed to vote on. And, um, at some point before the election and before the election mailing of these ballots happens, uh, usually anywhere from uh, two weeks to it, it could be as many as a couple months, this list is, is run and it's sent to a vendor to prepare the materials for mailing. And it depends on the size of the election office. If it is a large county, they probably have a uh, vendor who is doing the assembly of all of those ballot materials and maybe even printing the ballots for them. Um, when I say a large jurisdiction, I mean usually a registered voters of over 100,000 uh, in a jurisdiction. When you start talking about the municipal elections uh, that are held in some states, uh, municipal clerks that run those elections, uh, those jurisdictions oftentimes will do this, this uh, preparation themselves. But throughout that process, whether it's a vendor or in-house. There are security controls of the number of ballots that are being uh, inserted into envelopes. And there's always a cross-check of the, um, the number of ballots and materials that were put together and what was actually mailed out to voters. Um, now, what I'll tell you is that this is really where a lot of the stories you hear about people receiving more than one ballot or maybe receiving another person's ballot come from. Because the challenge is this voter registration list that's used for the mailing happens, it's a point in time, but as we know, life is very, um, uh, shall I say, uh, fluid and people move. People change their names, people die. And so from the moment that that list was printed to when those ballots are assembled, 
all of those things are happening. And this is why you hear of a person receiving a ballot for someone who's moved away months ago or maybe even years ago. It may be because the list is, is outdated in that point in time. So, uh, you know, if you're a voter, please update your voter registration. That's what we need you to do. That helps us get things to you. Um, so all of these things are happening up until the ballots are actually mailed and prepared. Once they are ready, they are mailed out. And from this point on, um, all of the controls in place are in conjunction usually with the USPS, the U United States Postal Service. Uh, many counties are using intelligent mail barcode, which really allows them to show when a ballot enters the mail stream, when the ballot envelope enters the mail stream, when it's delivered to a voter. And then on the return envelope, once the voter has voted and returns that envelope into the mail stream, it can also show election officials that has happened. That, that, that data is used to compare against the ballots that are actually received by the, the election office um, as they come in during that voting period. And so this is where really the nuts and bolts of the uh, controls that are in place that election officials use, like banks use to control your money and know how much money is in your individual bank account at any given time. Election of officials have many meticulous uh, controls that are counting the number of ballots that physically come in. They count them as they enter the election office or, or uh, processing center. They're comparing that that number to what the post office said they delivered. Um, at the same time that they're getting these ballots from postal wor workers, they're also getting them in drop boxes. And drop boxes are picked up by election officials in two member teams. Oftentimes they are bipartisan teams. Uh, those ballots are accounted for, they're hand counted. Again, they are put into that, that, that process in the individual election office that is maintaining control and always checking to make sure that every ballot, ballot is accounted for in the process. And um, one of the things that's happened as they are um, after they do these initial counts, election officials are going to check the signature on the envelope, or maybe in some states it might be an ID that's provided by the voter against what's on record in the office. And this is uh, this is to make sure that the ballots that they're receiving are ballots that are legitimate, that are, are issued to a voter, returned by that same voter that's eligible to participate. And they're making sure that those ballots um, are only, that only one ballot is going to be counted oftentimes, or not oftentimes, on occasion, a voter may return one, one more ballot. One, let me say that again. A voter may return a second ballot, or they may try to vote at an at a in-person voting center. And the checks and balances go back to that voter registration list, because once that signature has been verified by the voter, they're given credit for voting, and then they can't have another ballot submitted and counted. Um, at that same step, if the signature doesn't match, the voter is going to be notified by the local election officials in most states. And that serves two, two steps. One, it's making sure that the voter has an opportunity to correct any errors they might have made in submitting that ballot. But also, it gives the voter no, uh, notification that their ballot has been returned. Uh, we had a, a situation in Washington where a voter uh, who was away at college wanted to vote for B Bernie Sanders. He didn't get his absentee ballot. He contacted the local election official and was told that his ballot had already been returned. It turns out that his mother had voted the ballot for him. And uh, that check of notifying, uh, of him being notified, uh, excuse me, of him notifying the, com the county that he hadn't received his ballot was a security measure that allowed um, actually his mother to be prosecuted, I think, for, uh, for voting on his behalf, which is a felony. Um, so throughout the process, there are multiple layers of um, controls and checks and balances to account for every single ballot so that when we get to the point of counting ballots and through that canvassing period, every ballot is accounted for. And many of the, the larger jurisdictions actually have lean processes that they can reconcile to the ballot. They can tell you how many ballots were counted, out of the total number returned, how many were rejected and why they were rejected. And they account to a, a six sigma level of accuracy. So the, the ballots are, are accounted for, the ballots that are counted are ballots that are legitimately submitted by voters. And I'm out of time, but, uh, but that's a, a quick and dirty overview of how uh, elections, um, vote by mail elections are secured. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, next, we have uh, Secretary Grayson. 
Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm going to actually hit on a couple of the themes that my two uh, friends who spoke before me had mentioned when I talk about voting machines, voting systems. Uh, for a couple of decades now, actually probably for the entire history of voting, let's be frank, <laughs> people had questions about the use of voting machines and voting systems and their security. Um, thinking back 25 years ago, um, we can those of us who were of a certain age vividly remember the 2000 presidential election, um, which was extraordinarily close in, in punch card voting systems, which were an archaic and, and rarely used voting system. Um, came into publicity in Florida when a, one of the counties decided to creatively try to solve the problem of a very long ballot and created the, the butterfly ballot. And then when we were doing the recounts, we had a hard time figuring out whether the vote was a vote or not a vote. Um, we still had lever machines in that election. And so the Help America Vote Act um, spent gave states money to get rid of all the old voting systems and also to buy accessible machines. The challenge was that those machines that were purchased in the 2000s Many of them did not have a voter verified, voter verified paper trail and were using old technology and also were probably a little too vulnerable. And so uh, when this realization took place uh, and some conspiracy theories were spread in Ohio and Georgia, states that Democrats had done fairly well in when they switched to these types of machines, Republicans started doing better. Uh, actually, most famously, uh, somebody who's in the news now, Bobby Kennedy Jr., uh, wrote a piece in Rolling Stone um, arguing that the Ohio election had been stolen uh, for President Bush over Senator Kerry. Um, most states moved quickly and then others eventually moved to having votes cast on voter verified paper ballots. 2016 uh, election was dominated by stories of uh, foreign adversaries intervening in elections. While none of those uh, intervention attempts that we're aware of focused on voting systems. People, I think, thought about, oh, our seem, you know, maybe our machines are, are vulnerable when the actual attempts were at uh, voter registration databases and um, social media accounts. And then in 2020, famously, there was the fictional uh, conspiracy theory involving a, a decade, Hugo Chavez, who'd been dead for a decade, of Smartmatic voting systems, which aren't used anywhere outside of California, Dominion voting systems, which are used in Georgia, Italian servers and other kinds of things. And we continue to hear questions about voting systems. And in some communities, there's even an argument that we shouldn't use them to tabulate votes. We should count everything by hand. Um, I liked, uh, I forget which one, I think it was Kim used, a, either Kim or Tammy used the reference of uh, banking and security measures. Banks know they're vulnerable. Where, do, where If you're a thief and you want to go rob money, get cash, where do you go? You go to a bank. Why? Because that's where the money is. So banks know that. Uh, and they have all kinds of security measures in place to, to thwart you. Uh, so are they vulnerable? Sure. But they have cameras and die packs and limited amounts of dollars that are available uh, that could actually be stolen. You have uh, customers who are on the outlook. Employees are trained. Um, all kinds of safeguards to try to address those vulnerabilities. And it's rare nowadays that we hear of people actually robbing a bank. Um, we do this, a lot of those same things with voting systems. Could somebody hack a voting system if they had unlimited access in unlimited time and a lot of money? Probably. We know that. So what do we do about that? We put a lot of provisions in place, starting with the fact that um, in, most, uh, in most jurisdictions, you are required to use um, the voting systems that are certified to federal guidelines. So many states add their own certification process. And so the machines themselves are certified. Your cousin can't go out and build a voting system uh, that could be used to, to uh, cast and tabulate votes. So we, we certify those systems. Um, we move to paper so that the voter can verify and see that uh, either cast the vote by hand or with a ballot marking device, but they can see how their votes are read with their human eyes. Um, we. Uh, Tammy talked about trans, um, transparency. All this is done in a transparent process. We have poll workers who are bipartisan or not, at least nonpartisan, some cases nonpartisan in the polling place uh, watching what's going on. We have a certification process or a logic and accuracy test where the machines are programmed and then simulated elections are run to make sure that the outcomes are correct, that the machines were programmed correctly, and that if somebody pushes the button, it gets to the right candidate or colors in the square, the vote is awarded to the right candidate. So that's all done on the front end and that's done in an open meeting oftentimes, certified in open meeting with bipartisan folks who are your friends and your neighbors. 
after an election, uh, the count is observable, open and transparent, and done in a bipartisan way with your friends and neighbors. Um, many jurisdictions do some type of post-election audit so that they do a check a sample of ballots automatically in every election, or in some cases when it's a very close result. Other times we allow candidates, losing candidates, losing political parties to ask for a recount, where we go do a deeper dive and look uh, carefully at each particular ballot. And ultimately there are court proceedings. So there's all these safeguards that are in place um, from the beginning of the end to try to address you know, any kind of vulnerabilities that we might have with elections. All that being said, um, voting is, involves a lot of humans. We humans are not perfect. We make mistakes. Uh, and so sometimes things do happen. And so, um, and a lot of times when there's some allegations of shenanigans or cheating, it's simply a matter of a human error. I think most visibly recently uh, in the last election, uh, there were some allegations of flipping votes in Pennsylvania that if you cast a vote for one candidate on a ballot marking machine, it was actually casting the vote for another candidate. It was actually true, it was happening. But the reason why it was happening was because it was a, a calibration issue with the machines, which meant that the um, administrators didn't do a good job with their logic and accuracy testing. When they were testing the machines out, that is something that should have and would have been caught had they done the kinds of testing that every other jurisdiction in America does in advance of an election. And so we wouldn't have had the concern about that happening had they simply, the humans had simply done their job. It wasn't a machine problem. It was a process um, problem. Well, I mean, it was a machine problem, but it should have been caught. Our processes should have caught it. We've got, I know we're working with this uh, integrity project here in Arizona, and there was the, the problem with the ballots in Maricopa County because the paper was the wrong kind of paper. That was a human error. Uh, it wasn't, uh, the machine had its the specifications, the wrong kind of paper was used. Sometimes we hear stories about ballots, voters being turned away because there aren't enough ballots. Well, that's a human error for ordering the incorrect amount of paper. I remember when I was Secretary of State in Kentucky, we had a couple of situations where there were human mistakes that would have been caught had the logic and accuracy test been performed. In one case, uh, we have a straight ticket vote option in Kentucky. So you either color in um, the square or press the button on the ballot marking device and all of the Republican or Democratic candidates are selected um, automatically. It's an easy way to vote in a general election and a lot of voters take advantage of that when, if they're gonna vote a straight ticket. Well, in one of my county, in the counties where I, the county where I grew up, they didn't do a logic and accuracy test. They just relied upon the programmer's word that they'd done it correctly. And one of the races was left off of the straight ticket. But fortunately, we could catch that during a recount, but it was a mistake. It was a human error. Um, they just trusted the programmer instead of following the right procedures. I earlier alluded to this, this uh, desire by some communities to, to hand count. Um, because they don't trust the voting systems. The challenge is that that might work in a small jurisdiction. It might work on a single race. Um, you know, when we do a recount with this thing in Florida or Georgia, Georgia 2020, Florida in 2000, were very visible memories of recounts. There were hand recounts of those ballots after election day. They, they took several days. There were multiple people counting, so we build in redundancy so they can get to an agreement. It takes a long time and costs a lot of money. And it was only one race. Imagine if you have 12 races in the ballot plus a couple ballot questions and you were trying to hand count how much resources you'd have to invest from human capital and financial capital to have, you know, pay enough people to be able to count at, uh, at a quick enough level where we can get a results when we want to get results. And so hand counting is not practical. Uh, and in, if you don't put the amount of resources in, and in elections we know we never get the amount of resources we need, you're not going to be as accurate. The machine is more accurate, where the hand counting often is helpful is catching things that the machine read correctly, but where it's clear the voter had a different intent. Like on a hand marked ballot, somebody might have circled the name of the of the candidate as opposed to coloring in the square. Well, if we looked at that ballot, we would we would in most cases award that vote to the candidate whose name was circled because we would assume intent of the voter there, but a machine can't be programmed to do that. So there's times when hand counts and machine counts are different, but it takes a lot longer. And so the counties that are doing this are really doing a disservice and falling into the conspiracy theories like the crazy conspiracy theory in 2020 with Dominion, Chavez, and Smartmatic. I do want to end with something that's just starting to pop up into the news um, involving the privacy of a ballot, because that's one of the important features of our voting systems is that we can cast votes 
in a way that's private that nobody knows. And there's a story breaking out of Texas that it, it looks like it may have been possible um, to have to identify through open records requests and looking at some other um, data points, the, the identity of uh, the person who cast the ballot. Assuming that reporting is true and from some of the out the uh, vote beat just did a story on it, and that's a pretty trusted outlet in the elections world. Um, Texas, that particular jurisdiction was following some procedures and processes that other counties wouldn't have used. And so if they used the correct transparency processes and redacted information or didn't use some of the uh, some other follow some other procedures that are kind of unique to that jurisdiction, that wouldn't have been able to be um, identified. So again, that's a human error, not a machine error. The machines aren't perfect, don't get me wrong, um, but the human error, the human element of this is incredibly important. And so in some voting system allegations have been going on for since the beginning of time, um, we rely upon voting systems to help make it easier for people to vote and make it easier for us to count the votes correctly, accurately, and as quickly as possible. Um, and we build in systems to try to maintain our, the, the safety and security and accuracy of those elections. And in almost every case, whenever there's a failure, it's because of a human failure, not because of the machine, because of these safeguards that we build in. Thanks. Look forward to questions later. Thank you. Uh, and now we will turn to uh, Nate personally. Well, thanks so much. I turned off my video, Trey, so that I could erect my Palm Beach butterfly ballot voting machine in the background. Just, you know, if, if ever there was a crowd where I should have that in the background. Yeah, I, I did cheat you up there, Nate. Glad to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was, you know, you look back on the problems of the 2000 election. In some ways, I think we get nostalgic for it. Uh, but this was one of those ballot machines that was used in um, 2000 election in Palm Beach County. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to fast forward really to today and talk about the new and emerging challenges uh, particularly as it relates to AI. Um, there's been, I think, a lot of concern about the effect of AI on this election. Um, as was mentioned in my intro, I direct the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford and um, also with uh, Trey and, and, and Tammy worked on the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. And so as, I, as we approach this election, I see my worlds colliding as we think about um, uh, new tech and how that's going to have an effect on this election. Where I'm going to end up is going to be that I'm worried that actually the panic over AI is its own democracy problem, and that um, the the risks of AI and synthetic imagery have been overstated for reasons I'll explain. But that doesn't mean it's not a problem. I mean the 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 fact that we are panicking over AI is I think independently um, uh, something to be concerned about. But let me try to situate this. Uh, the, the AI and tech discussion and the larger discussion about where we are in election administration in this country. And so I think there's several um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, potentially damaging influences on on public opinion and um, uh, public perception of what's happening in, in the election infrastructure. Um, the first, I'll, I'll start um, where we maybe should have been a few years ago, which is that most states now have new laws, whether it was passed during uh, COVID or as a response to COVID, we have incredible amount of legal change in the last three and a half years. Um, in addition, as Tammy said, we there is this large sort of resignations of election officials um, so that up to a third or so of election officials will not have had uh, will not have uh, administered a, a presidential election before. Now it's not so clear that the trajectory of resignations, as the BPC report, or the Bipartisan Policy Center's excellent report on this shows, it's not clear that that trajectory is so different than the trajectory we are on. But it's still the case that we've had you know a considerable number of resignations. Um, and it's no surprise that we have, given that the the death threats and other kinds of pressures that that our uh, election officials are being subjected to. And so, we have new laws, we have new people who are interpreting them, and then we've got um, unprecedented uh, challenges that these election officials are are confronting, both um, you know, online and offline. Uh, and you you need only listen to the the voicemails of some of our friends in the election official community uh, to see those uh, the the real threats that they're facing. At the same time, we have incredible polarization and collapse in confidence in the election infrastructure. 
uh, so that you have, you know, depending on how how you look at it, 30 percent or more of the American um, electorate thinks that the election infrastructure is unsafe, that, that there's rampant fraud, uh, and of course that the 2020 election was not legitimate. Um, and so into that soup of new laws, new people, new challenges, heightened scrutiny and low confidence, we now throw a new technology, which is artificial intelligence. Now, as in other social systems and the way AI is going to affect them, the basic rule is that AI will amplify all the abilities of good and bad actors in the system to achieve all the same goals that they've always had. That's true if you're a foreign government that had had sort of uh, difficulty getting English language speakers and uh, you want to try to influence the uh, election online for, um, you know, in an English uh, speaking country like the United States, but it's also true for challengers who now uh, of incumbents who now want to use AI and uh, some of these new tools to, um, I have one student who started a company and they have something called a campaign consultant in a box uh, so that you can have an AI uh, that, that helps uh, challengers put up uh, materials, jingles, things like that. And so AI is a tool um, and, you know, we, we can think about, uh, you how appropriate it is to sort of graft our concerns that we've had about social media over the last 10 years and then graft them wholesale onto uh, AI because I think they're they're very different technologies that the dissemination of um, uh, certain kinds of content is very different than the widespread creation of it, which is what uh, AI is going to do. Uh, but the media has not treated it as such uh, that the 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 Media has raised the alarm. You can see headlines from just the last week or two in the Washington Post that AI deepfakes threaten to upend global elections. No one can stop them, that it's out of control. And as a result, right now, if you look at, at recent uh, polling from Elon University or even Axios and uh, the Morning Consult, a majority of Americans now think that um, that, that AI produced disinformation will have an impact on deciding who wins the 2024 election. And so here's why I am more concerned about the perception than I am about uh, the reality here. Um, the, the, the platforms, the internet platforms have had to deal with AI for uh, a, you know, a decade or so already. It's no mistake that Facebook takes down 4 billion accounts a year. These are not human beings. These are you know, bots that are, that are being put up there. Um, Secondly, there's been a retreat from political content generally on Facebook so that the share of sort of information or journalism that you, that you would have in your feed if you're the average person is actually quite small. Uh, most of what they've done is elevated sort of friends and family content. Uh, and this is in part because of the kind of TikTokification of, of all of uh, Facebook products. I mention that because the, the countermeasures that they have employed that have decreased journalism, decreased um, uh, political content on the platform also uh, would apply to synthetic media and AI generated content. And so even though most of the people on this call are sort of wondering what I'm talking about, how could it be that um, you know everyone's Facebook feed doesn't look like mine where it's got all this election information and, and politics in it, um, for the average person, their Facebook feed is under 5%, anything that we would call sort of journalism, politics, civic content. Um, and so then you have to ask the question of that small share of their feed that is even in the kind of realm of voting related information, what share is going to be AI generated and sort of maliciously AI generated? And it's going to be a, a you know tinier share even than that. So let's say 1% generously of that 5% of civic slash political content. Now that, as with all things internet related, that doesn't mean there aren't gonna be a, a, a small group of voters or a small share of voters, which could be millions, who will be get, ha, having a large amount of this content. But for the average voter, um, it's going to be uh, very rare that they're fed this kind of content on uh, Facebook and, and most of the other platforms as well. Um, the real challenge is that the mainstream media is going to report on some of this AI generated content and draw a lot of attention to it. Uh, and then 
it, sort of the confidence that will be shot from that small share of AI uh, generated material is going to then infect people's perceptions of the 99.9% .9 of their feed, which is not, um, uh, not AI generated. And so th this is related to what social scientists call the liar's dividend, that people, um, what's going to happen is that the main harm here is not that people are going to start believing false stuff, but actually that they're going to stop believing true stuff. And that is a particular danger when it comes to um, the, the communication from election officials and, and stuff related to the uh, the election infrastructure and the voting process, because we need to make sure um, that uh, we give as many resources as we can to these election officials to be the authoritative sources of election administration uh, information, and uh, and that uh, you, that the loss of trust that comes from these errant things that are going to be covered on cable news or in the newspaper that then draw attention to. Uh, deep fakes uh, doesn't then affect our confidence um, uh, in the rest of of media. I want to just conclude with with uh, one note about that we that we cannot tech our way out of this problem. There's going to be a lot of um, efforts over the next year to try to develop watermarking systems, other kinds of systems of att attestation for video and and still imagery. Um, but the, the problem with disinformation and, and as it relates to AI is as much an emotional and psychological one as it is sort of thinking about this as a, as a cognitive problem that, that people are not getting the information. They're sort of uh, not able to evaluate what's real and what's true. Um, what we're going to see and what you can see right now, if you go on Twitch TV and put in Trump or Biden, you can see 24 hour a day, a 24 hour debate a uh, day debate between avatars of Trump and Biden right now. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of examples of deep fakes that are already out there. Most of them are crude, um, uh, the ones that are done for politics, but there will be some that'll that'll be good as we as we approach uh, election day. Um, the real question is, you know, can we and can the platforms amplify the voices of the responsible election officials uh, to counteract some of that uh, synthetic content? Um, uh, and in particular, will the mainstream media um, uh, do its role in sort of not amplifying a lot of this problematic content and uh, drawing attention to it? So I'll end there. Okay, thanks to everyone for uh, those presentations. I'm, I'm going to kick it off by asking a, a ridiculously broad question, which is that summing up the uh, 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 the presentation by the practitioners is against uh, the presentation of uh, Nate personally. There seems to be a disconnect between the potential vulnerabilities of the election system and misinformation about how that system operates, uh, where on the one hand, you have the actual process of registration and administration and counting the ballots, and the other or another is the injection of false information about politics. Uh, and so, Question one is that, is there a set of practices that might inoculate people from those false claims? And one example that ha happens in Wisconsin in Dane County where I live is that the county clerk uh, typically places ballot images of all the ballots cast online so people can get access to them uh, on their own. Is there a set of best practices that might be available to uh, enhance confidence in the election system. I want to kick it to Tammy uh, because I but 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 serve it up to her here a little bit, which is that what what she identified with respect to transparency and the fact that even in the kind of pre AI world, you could end up with um, you know decontextualized imagery of what's happening in a in a um, in a accounting center I and mean, we know what happened in in Atlanta uh last time with respect to this and so so I just want to emphasize that this is an age old problem and I think election officials have been you know there's lots of different tactics but Tammy I'll turn it over to you as to how you might describe those 
Yeah, I appreciate that. So here's here's part of the challenge is that yet again, we're piling another piece, another responsibility in the conduct of an election onto election officials to um, challenge them with the um, instilling confidence in our entire institution of elections when they have been tasked in the past with the conduct of that election um, in, you know, it's one of those things where 20 years ago, Nate sitting there with the with the Palm Beach behind him, election administration was sort of an administrative function. It was a clerical function. And then we laughed after the Help America Vote Act that it became um, they needed to be IT managers. And then in 2016, it was cybersecurity um, experts. In 2020, it was health experts, public health experts. And after the 2020 election, it was now you also need to be um, a, a an expert in communications around mis and dis and malinformation. So we keep asking our more and more of our election officials without supporting them with proper resources um, and additional staffing and other things that they need. Here's part of the additional complication of that challenge is that this continues to happen because we have seen um, those who are um, purveyors of these false narratives it's incentivized and they're not being held accountable. Um, and so for years I've said, we need to remove the incentives, whether it's in a primary or uh, in fundraising or what have you. Um, and we need to hold people accountable who are not speaking the truth about the integrity of our systems because the truth has to happen. It has to matter. And it has to be that when election officials are speaking to their public, um, that the truth penetrates, um, as 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 Nate mentioned. I have a, a a member of the National Association that said they had taken a public tour through their facility. They walked through all of the safeguards, all of the things that they do to make sure that there's integrity to the system, that it's legitimate. And they were talking to this one individual throughout the whole thing. And afterwards, they talked to him for another 20 minutes, and the, and the voter said, "Look, let's just set the facts aside." This is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I believe. And so if we are in a moment where the facts don't matter, where individuals are just looking for support of their own narrative and their own belief system, then we can't expect election officials to be the ones to crack this nut. They can do everything that they can, but they're not getting additional resources to be able to um, to try and combat this tsunami of mis and disinformation that is coming at them. And it will only increase, I think, as we head into November, because there are foreign adversaries who are seeking to sow chaos in the system, and they're going to continue to do so. Let me just add and, and try to turn this in a little more positive uh, uh, direction, because I, I think the thing we've forgotten to, to mention in this hour that we've been talking is elections are run at the local level. There's not some overarching election czar that gets to decide who wins and who loses elections. We have over 8,800 election officials who are either appointed or elected in local communities across the country whose sole job is to make sure that their voters get the correct ballot that are eligible to participate and that that ballot's counted accurately. So I think the first thing is empower the voters. Um, if you have questions about the election in your your county, in your municipality, go and observe. The, the process is open and transparent and you have that ability to do it. And I would actually challenge you to sign up to be a poll worker or work at an early voting center um, and, and be part of it, or maybe even be an extra help person who processes absentee or mail-in ballots, because that work will give you an insider's view of all of the security controls and measures that are in place in your community. And then you can start extrapolating to your own state and then across the country. And hopefully by the next time we have a presidential election, people will actually have confidence that our election system is secure. Let me, uh, a couple of things. One, I, uh, on Kim's suggestion about being a poll worker, that's what I do now. I go in, Kentucky has early voting now, and I go in on the Saturday of early voting, and I'm a poll worker. So uh, two Saturdays ago, I got there and, and did my shift, and I checked in voters. I printed ballots on demand, and, and um, it was a really rewarding experience, and I even got paid a couple hundred dollars for my trouble. Yay. And it was Kentucky, uh, not subject to Kentucky income tax, so there's that, too. Um 
but there, you know, go back to the, the question of like, you know, I think there, there are things that we talked about today that, you know, reminding voters about these safeguards. But what's what's interesting is surveys are starting to come out a lot over the last few months, which basically tell the following story. Voters have confidence in their own states or local jurisdictions elections, which makes sense. They're the most familiar with that. As Kim said, they're run by the locals. They're run by their friends and neighbors, like I was talking about earlier. They don't have as much confidence in other states' elections. And so I think there's a couple of ways to you know, approach this. One, Kim and I, and actually Tammy, I think has been involved. We've all been involved in some of these conversations about trying to get folks to say, you know, my state elections are great. I'm not an expert on Arizona, but I can tell you that all states, including Arizona, have voter registration and authenticate voters, and they have transparency and bipartisanship baked in. They're run at the local level. There's um, voter verified paper ballots and signature verified, all these things, and you can go through it. I'm just going to shorten it for the, but all those states ha have that. So I know that Arizona has that, and that's why I have confidence in Arizona running its elections well. So and 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 a lot of a lot of um, a lot of folks in politics will just kind of like circle with what they know. They feel comfortable with that. But more of us, we need to talk about those safeguards that exist in every single state. Elections look different in Arizona than they do in Kentucky, but we have those commonalities. Another positive thing and with Nate on here is working with um, researchers in the academy to figure out, are there interventions? Are there messages? Are there approaches that actually move the needle? Not just anecdotally move the needle, but actually move the needle. And so there are some um, efforts in that. I'm actually, I think, Kim and I are going to be at a conference next week. Actually, maybe Tammy. Maybe we're all going to be there. I don't know. We're always together at things um, where it's a mixture of academics, practitioners, funders talking about um, what can we do and how can we measure its effectiveness so that if it works, then it becomes a best practice. I mean, there are we know from a, an administrative standpoint, there are best practices. Post-election audits are a best practice. Logic and accuracy testing on the front end is a best practice. Making sure your voting systems use paper that's voter verified is a best practice. Bipartisanship, transfer, those are best practices. But how do we communicate all that? That's something I think we need to, to, to learn more about. As Kim's right, there are grifters that are out there trying to make money to sow disinformation and take advantage of the fact that even in your own state, while you might trust the elections in your own state, you don't really know why. Because you don't understand it very well. You just have been around it enough. You feel confident. Um, so those are some things that we need to continue to work on. And and, and you, as Tammy said, you can't put all that on the election administrator. Um, it's, it's incumbent upon the rest of us uh, to help out. So, Nate, any thoughts on uh, research showing whether there are certain kinds of interventions that might be effective? Well, when it when it comes to sort of correcting disinformation, you know, it, it, this is just a general law of public opinion at this point, which is that if you get people from the the user the, or the viewer's tribe to vouch for the um, the sanctity of the election, it's going to go a lot farther than if um, you know someone they don't know is vouching for it, let alone um, the political opponent, right? And so, one of the one of the efforts that's underway in this election by our former bosses, uh, for many of us from uh, Bob Bauer and Ben Ginsburg, is to develop this Pillars of the Community initiative to try to get local faith and business leaders to vouch. To, to sort of partner with election officials to, uh, if not vouch, but to at least sort of be confidence enhancing in their messaging relating uh, to the election. I mean, but we we need to sort of think about the different threats and where they're coming from. Um, you know, dis as is generally true in the disinformation world, disinformation comes from the top. Yes, there is going to be stuff that bubbles up where somebody randomly puts on Twitter some kind of, uh, you know, ballot box and dumpster kind of thing. Um, but th there's really nothing that election officials will be able to do if, if a candidate um, is denying, you know, the integrity of the election to their followers, right? And so our, our friend Ben Ginsburg talks as a podcast called Saints, Sinners, and Salvageables. And there's a large, you know, part of the population that you're not going to be able to persuade. But the key is for those who aren't paying attention most of the time to election administration issues, can you get credible signalers, both election officials and people from, you know, both parties to say that, look, this is, uh, you know, th these rumors are untrue or here's the reason why uh, we vouch for the system. Okay, well, I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative to ask another ridiculously high-level question, which is that much of the time, uh, access and integrity are 
held to be intention, that if you make it easier for people to vote, that can increase the risks of some kind of breach, uh, and that the way to make voting more secure is simply to tighten the rules and make it more difficult for people to register or to cast a ballot, whether we're talking about the documentation they need to show. Is, is that right from, from your perspective? Are th those two uh, really in tension or is that a false dichotomy? I'll jump in. Um, I can tell you when I started in elections as an election director at the county level, um, I always looked at things that we were doing with that perspective. And when I became an actual elected official and a policymaker, that was sort of my guideline of any policy that became came before us is how is something that's going to increase accessibility going to have that balance on the other side of security. And for the 30 years I worked in elections, that was a lane that I always tried to be thinking about and be in, in terms of, of doing the job, because you go to either extreme, you make it really difficult to, to be able to access voter registration or really difficult to get a ballot you're going to have a probably have a very secure system, but it's not going to be very accessible. And and on the on the flip side, if you um, if you open things up so widely that just anyone could vote, then that people won't believe the results because there's no security and there's no validation that that the people that cast the ballots were the ones who were eligible. And I I think that that their intention for a good reason, and that that you always want to have them be um, kind of compensating each other in a positive way, and that it always has to go back to the voter experience. Well, uh, let me say one thing about um, where we are now in the access integrity debate. So uh, my chief concern in this election is voter and election official confusion. Uh, for the reasons I described before, not just related to disinformation, but also the new laws, the incredible scrutiny, all of this. Right now, I think that um, you know we need to get the rules in place. The litigation needs to start concluding. We need to get ready for, for the 2024 election. That sometimes a clear bad rule is going to be better from an accessibility standpoint than an ambiguous um, um, perfect rule. And so I think that... Um, you know, we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about like the voter ID debate or, or you know, reducing the number of days of, of mail ballots and things like that. Um, as you know, Ken, the, the, the data on, on the effects of most of this stuff is really quite small, particularly in a presidential election. Um, but uh, what, you know, what I'm worried about is that that if there is too much, play, if there's ambiguity in these rules, that that actually allows for all kinds of um, potential arguments in polling places and and litigation leading up to the election, let, ago, let alone litigation uh, after the fact. And so I think we're at this kind of strange inflection point where um, um, the access and integrity debate is it's not kind of an either or. Um, both are affected by perceptions about um, um, the rules for, for voting. Yeah, to build on that, I think we have a couple of, of really um, relevant um, examples. So for voter registration, when you have uh, something like online voter registration or participation in ERIC, both of those um activities allow for convenience to the voter. It allows for the system to maintain um, the integrity of the information and the data because for online voter registration, you don't have someone filling out a, a paper form it by hand and handing it to a complete stranger you know, at the county fair or in front of the supermarket with their signature and their information floating around. And that's not to say that GOTV efforts are bad, but you should have the ability as a as an eligible voter, as a registered voter, to update your information online. That's a convenience, but there's also security to it. Um, participating in ERIC was a way in which the states could verify and validate information with neighboring states to make sure people um, weren't voting in two places and that eligible voters had the ability to get registered before election day. Something like drop boxes, you know, Kim laid out beautifully the 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 gambit of, of uh, 
ways in which voting by mail or voting absentee can be both a convenience and be secure for voters. If people are concerned about you know, what has previously been called ballot harvesting, make sure your voters can access drop boxes. Make sure your voters can use a postmark and put it in the postal stream and still um, get back to the election office and still be counted um, you know, and, and secured because all of those have you know, ways in which the authentication of the voter takes place, whether it's signature verification or some unique number that they have to provide, like the date of issuance of their driver's license or the last four of their social or whatever it happens to be. These are all very important ways in which states secure those procedures and policies. But each function of the election can be weaponized. Anything. It can be the fact that, and my most recent example is, it's a best practice for election officials to put a small hole in their vote by mail ballot envelope so that you can make sure that the envelope has had the ballot extracted. And also the placement of that hole allows for voters with visual disabilities to be able to feel where to sign. That's been a best practice for over a decade. And recently that's been weaponized as a way for um, supposedly election officials are using it to see how, or people are using it to see how someone voted um, so that they can throw away the ballot or what have you. I mean, these kinds of crazy conspiracies come about and are directed towards any single function of the election field. So we have to make sure that we are addressing those concerns but again, it circles back to the truth has to matter, the facts have to matter, and we have to make sure that those who are purveying this information um, are held accountable when it's debunked and um, and corrected. Let me throw out a couple more um, examples where there is that intersection of accessibility and security. My, our Secretary of State, Mike Adams, he didn't coin this, he just uses it a lot. Easy to vote, hard to cheat. And we've described a bunch of things that have made elections easier but build integrity. Um, you know, but another one that I thought of was an online portal to request an absentee ballot. So in states where you don't automatically get it sent to you, um, ma that makes it easier than having to request the form or going to the form. But having an online portal, you submit it. All that pop all that information is automatically sent to the election administrator. It goes straight to the labels. It goes straight into the databases. It's great. But it also means that we can keep track of IP addresses. So if we're getting a lot of hits from a certain address, we can go look. Oh, it's a public library. That makes sense. Oh, it's a nursing home. That makes sense. Or a dorm room. Oh, wait, that's a single family home. Hmm. Let's go investigate. So having that um, online portal makes it easier to get that ballot. And it also builds in um, a safeguard. Paper ballots, actually, um, in some ways, you know, there's some accessibility challenges for voters with disabilities, but the um, had the ability to have more people voting at one time. You know, when we were using the just simple machine, when we were using DREs or lever, or uh, punch card machines or lever machines, um, you had a backup waiting at the line to check in, and then you had a backup waiting to use the machine. And the beauty of paper is you could just have a bunch of tabletops, and people can come in and have a lot of people voting at once. And so that um, has shortened lines, um, but then we have the piece of paper that we can go back and look at. And I'm going to say something a little provocative here, um, and that's okay because we're almost done. And and but I having been a poll worker, one of the things I've noticed, Kentucky is a pretty is a strict ID state. In our e-poll books, we scan the back of the photo ID and immediately finds the voter in the in the voter registration database, pulls up their photo with their information. It makes check-in a snap. This, I mean, it, it is that quick. And so I think I, I appreciate the security that a photo ID um, provides, but I can tell you as a poll worker, it makes my job a lot easier when voters bring those to the polls. And so um, I'm going to stop there because those the IDs can be tend a little bit pop, um, polarizing, except among polling data and among actual Americans, everybody supports it basically. But as a, from a poll worker, it has made it a lot easier to do my job. And, and from a voter standpoint, there are a lot fewer check-in errors because you can always be found quickly, or we can determine you're not actually registered and figure out what the problem is. It's not because I couldn't find you because I didn't hear you correctly or the pages stuck together or whatever. And so that's an example of that intersection of um, access and integrity. Okay, thank you. I see from uh, Scott popping back in that we've likely reached the end. So I'll turn it back over to him. So close. I would keep this going forever, even with the Twitch I have now from the Palm Beach County visual aid. That, that well, I have to say just personally. one thing that that I, I taught a seminar on election administration this last semester. 
And I spend a lot of time going through what happened in 2000 and show them not just two-dimensional photographs, but it was from the Orlando Sentinel that shows the perspective of the voter, uh, what, it what it looked like. And the students, 24 years after the fact, were it, it, showing them was as if I had said, I shook hands <laughs> with Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. They were just <laughs> sort of blown away at how primitive uh, that looked. So I am deeply I impressed, imagine. Nate, that, that you were able to snag <laughs> one of those because it's no longer possible. Uh, I appreciate it. This has been fantastic. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody here again, our panel, Tammy Patrick, uh, Dr. Nate Persley, and Secretaries Kim Wyman and Trey Grayson, as well as our moderator, uh, Dr. Kenneth Mayer of the event's co-sponsor. Um, the Integrity Project, uh, we're about creating tools like this, addressing the disinformation challenges today as a 501c3 nonprofit. We're able to do this only through the generous contributions of people such as yourself. Uh, so we invite you to learn more about opportunities for engagement or support via our website at tip. AZ.org. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Hope you all enjoyed uh, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much.